the story of Edward L. Doheny, Empire Builder and Oil King. Doheny first saw the light of day in 1856 at Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. He came of venturesome Irish-Canadian stock and possessed an instinct for excitement and a mind as brilliant as a diamond. Edward had to work for the greater part of each year as he grew to manhood, but he graduated from high school at the early age of 15. It was in high school that he learned the mineralogy and chemistry that was to earn his fame and fortune. He wanted to see the United States, so he went into New Mexico as a government mule buyer when but 16. Then he began buying and selling horses for himself and made quite a profit. He heard the wilderness call again, however, this time with the added lure of gold. We find him with his Indian guides, Long Joe and Black Eagle. Oh, Long Joe. <laughs> what would you say if I decided to go back to Arizona? Uh, so he and his friend tired of Black Range Mountain? Oh, I'm plenty tired. I don't think I could have stuck it out this long if you hadn't been a long engine. <laughs> You're the whitest red man I ever saw. And Doheny, best Indian. <laughs> well, Mark one up for you, Long Joe. Yeah, you never complain, so I won't either. We'll stick it out a while longer. Well, there's plenty of gold indications around here. It just takes iron to get to it, I guess. Well, here goes. Doheny, look. Someone come riding. More than one. Huh? Say, so you're right. I wonder who'd be riding up in this country just for the fun of it. Eh, no fun. Trouble, maybe. Oh, quick. Long Joe. New black eagle. Uh, oh, my God. Uh, hide behind that ledge over there. Take off your shirts and hats and put on your headbands and your feathers. We may have to use the old Indian scare on them. Eh, good. I go. Give signal if you want Indian scare. <laughs> <laughs> good engines. <laughs> Well, strangers, what can I do for you fellas? Nothing but clear out. Clear out? Well, I staked out these claims. Why should I leave them now? Found any pay dirt yet? No. And you ain't likely to, so clear out. Yeah, get going, partner. I reckon you'll have to give me a better reason than that, mister. Lead poisoning is a better reason, maybe. Oh, huh? Guns, huh? Yeah. I guess I don't have to tell you that I'm unarmed. You can see that. But why is my claim so all fired and important to you? Are you going to ride out of Black Range, or will they be carrying you? I can take a hint, mister. Just let me whistle for my horse. Well, why don't he come? Hey, what are you waiting for? Hey, 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 hey we got a hair. Come on. come on, boys. Let's get Hey, look. Look, there's one of them now by that lick. Hey, Ryan, right to your right. Come on, man. All right, Long Joe. Black Eagle, they're gone. Didn't scare work. He's good. I'll say it worked good. Those plane jumpers took one look and then fanned the breeze. They'll ride all the way to the border at the rate they're going. Plane jumpers. Bad men. He's bad. <laughs> well, they did us a good turn, Long Joe. Yes, sir, they sure did. Mm, good turn? Oh. By being so anxious to get me out of the Black Range Mountains, they must know something about the signs. We'll stay here right enough. Now I'm sure there's gold in these here hills. Why, you couldn't get Dohini away now if you used dynamite. <laughs> Doheny was more than right. He struck gold. In less than three months, a town of 5,000 people had sprung up. Railway and telegraph facilities were established, and Doheny was a bonanza king. His next strike was a silver placer mine, and now, though but 24, Doheny was recognized as an important mine operator. He formed a partnership with C.A. Canfield, who possessed an amazing ability for discovering valuable mines. With this partner, he developed one property which netted him a profit of half a million dollars a year. Then, with the difficulties solved and only profits remaining, Doheny sold out. The following years were full of ups and downs, with Edward roaming the wilderness, completely happy, sleeping under the stars. And then he happened to go to Los Angeles, California, and one day was attracted by a wagon load of brown material that resembled some manganese ore that he used to mine in New Mexico. Hey, hey, driver! 
Now, uh, wait a minute. Hey, why on earth are you stopping that man, Ed? I want to take a look at that stuff he's carting around, Canfield. Now, come on over the wagon with me. Now, you've got some crazy notions. You know, this is the first time that we've seen one another for several years, and you you take me over to look at a wagon load of dirt. <laughs> Maybe it'd be another form of pay dirt for us. Oh, you, driver, what is this you're carrying? That is Brea, senor. Brea? What's that? He's Brea is all I know. I, uh, I believe that Brea is a Spanish word for pitch, Ed. Pitch? Pitch? Come on, Samuel. We're going for a wagon ride. What? Well, sure. Hey, move over, driver. Take us to where you got this. Back to Westlake Park, but I have been paid to take it away, senor. I'll pay you twice as much to take it and us back to this Westlake Park, my friend. But, Ed, on this wagon... Why not? You've heard the saying, hitch your wagon to a star. Well, I'm hitching my star to this wagon, Canfield. Because if what I suspicion pans out, this here wagon's carrying our next fortune. Get out, you hawk. Come on. Where's my spark? Whoa! Whoa, Nick! Now, come on, Canfield. You know, uh, if this is a wild goose chase, I'll make you pay the cleaning bill for my suit and shoes, Ed. <laughs> it's a deal. Here, come on. Look at this ground here, Canfield. Why, it oozes tar. Exactly. And don't you see, Canfield? These tar exudes bear the same relation to the petroleum below that rosin on the outside of a tree bears to the sap within. My friend, there's oil here. Oil for you and me. All we have to do is drill for it. Doheny knew nothing about the oil business, so he prospected for the black gold as he had prospected for the yellow, sinking a shaft 155 feet in 28 days. He struck oil here, and this was the beginning of a new phase in Doheny's career. He had a hand in virtually every big oil field development in the West. His income was enormous. Los Angeles, Bakersfield, and Fullerton were studded with oil wells. The results of his confidence and determination. But Doheny became restless again. The West at the beginning of the 20th century was very different from the West in which Doheny had fought Indians, walked 800 miles without meeting more than one white man, depended on his marksmanship for his daily food. He must find a new world to conquer, and decided on Mexico. With his associate, Mr. Canfield, Doheny invaded Mexico, and at Tampico, picked up an Indian guide who led them into a dense jungle. Oh, it's hot. <laughs> oh, but this is living, Canfield. To be on the trail again. And this Indian said he could lead me to a pool of oil. Bubbling up out of the ground. Yeah, well, these Indians will say anything to get some money from you. Oh, that hunch I had in Los Angeles worked out all right, didn't it? You bet it did. Yeah, and this one will, too. Why, Mexico hasn't been worked at all, partner. She's wide open. Poor. Poor. Hold on here. The pool? Why, yes. I can see something shining through the leaves there. Here, come on, Pansio. Come on, let's get down and take a look. What? What's that noise? I don't know. But... It can feel. Look. It's oil. It's a whole pool of oil. And look at those big bubbles of gas escaping. Oh, man, oh, man. We... We struck another bonanza. I'm going to buy as much of Mexico as I can and drill every inch of it. <laughs> Here, Doheny drilled and got the biggest oil gusher in the world. The Mexican Petroleum Company, headed by Doheny, boomed. Withstanding the later competition of Texas oil, and during the famine in Mexico, Doheny fed and cared for the sufferers in the land that had given him so much. From then on, well after well came in, repaying Doheny and Canfield hundreds of times over for the gamble they had made on coming into Mexico in 1900. As the years passed and his fortune mounted, he looked about for a way to spend his millions so as to help his fellow man. He was as generous with his philanthropies as he was with his friendship. To one cause alone, the Irish relief, he gave four million dollars and financed the building of one of the most beautiful Catholic churches in California, St. Vincent's. Then one day, we find him at a director's meeting 
at the University of Southern California. Well, gentlemen, you may wonder why I've asked for this meeting. You've always been interested in the university, Mr. Doheny. Yes, but now I want to show my interest in a more concrete form. I've had many experiences in my life. I've roamed the ranges, slept under the stars, fought competitors, and swung many a big business deal. And when all is said and done, the most important thing to young people is education. Learning played a most important part in my life. Without my early education, I doubt very much if I would now have the $1,200,000 to give toward an establishment of a library here at the University of Southern California. $200,000? Mr. Doheny, how can we express our gratitude? Well, I'm the grateful one, my friend. You just tell the young folks who study here to concentrate on two important things, and they'll get along fine. Education and friends. Yes, sir. Education and friends. Such was the life of a man whose love for his fellow men, his honesty, courage, optimism, his industry, vision, generosity, and modesty have endeared him to the world. He was a pioneer by heritage, an engineer and prospector by profession, an adventurer by instinct. Edward L. Doheny, Captain of Industry. <laughs> <laughs>